again, with this being Memorial Day weekend, uh, we certainly uh, don't want to forget uh, to honor those who have fallen uh, on behalf of the freedoms that we observe on a daily basis. Um, but at the same time, uh, the ultimate sacrifice for sin uh, was paid by Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, and that's exactly what that song uh, has talked about. And certainly, uh, we need to remember that Jesus died for sinners like me. Uh, he died for sinners like you. Amen. Um, and the sinless became sin, the Bible said. Um, he was punished uh, for crimes he did not commit. That's right. uh, he became sin uh, from the spotless lamb of God. And so how can we have a memorial day weekend when we remember the fallen without remembering first the sacrifice that Jesus made Amen. for us? Uh, today we're going to be talking about choosing sides and we're going to be actually talking about uh, battles and choosing sides. And I want you to know that before we even begin uh, the regular message today, that there's a battle uh, that has taken place and a battle that uh, is ongoing. Uh, the first battle is the one that uh, was fought for your eternal soul. Uh, for those of you who are Christians, uh, that means for those who can go back to a time and place when you prayed and you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, uh, that battle is now won. Uh, that battle is won in your life uh, because you're no longer a, a child of Satan. You're a child of God. Um, and you've accepted uh, that free gift of salvation that only the blood of Jesus can provide you. Uh, for those of you who cannot claim uh, that you're a Christian, you, you uh, have never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You have never uh, asked him to save your soul. Uh, the battle continues. Uh, because as long as the Spirit is dealing with you, there is a battle that's taking place that uh, the enemy wants to keep you unsaved. The, the enemy wants to keep you dying in your own <laughs> sins and ultimately having to be with uh, him uh, in a real place called hell. Uh, but Jesus never intended uh, for that to happen. That's why he died on the cross for your sins. And he's battling now. The Holy Spirit uh, is speaking uh, to you even now in your heart and in your mind about giving uh, your heart and life over to Jesus. And so when we talk about choosing sides and when we talk about battles today, uh, I want you to understand that God intends no one to die and go to that place. I don't know if you've read the scripture uh, that's on, or the partial scripture that's outside on our marquee. Uh, but it talks about that, and we preached about it last Sunday. And, and God intends for no, none of his creatures to die and go to a place called hell. Certainly, uh, those of us uh, who are hearing and listening to uh, the call of the Holy Spirit today. So I hope uh, that you allow God to speak to your heart and your mind today, uh, and you make that choice uh, before it's everlasting too late. But uh, have you ever been in a battle this morning? Um, I know on a serious note, uh, there are people who have been in a battle in service of our country and, and we want to thank them and uh, we want to honor those who have died but, and certainly thank those who are still living. But uh, at a time, uh, this battle was a time where these men and these women risked their lives uh, on behalf of the freedoms that we enjoy every day. Um, I know there's other types of battles like people here today who have battled against addictions like drugs and alcohol and, and pornography and, and, and other battles that are in our lives over uh, those things that the enemy would want to wreck us with or, or maybe on a lighter side uh, and maybe not as serious a note, uh, you've been in a battle with your spouse or, or children uh, and, and in, in any of those cases, when it comes to a battle, there's always two sides, are there not? Um, in battles between Lori and I, and, and we have those from time to time, uh, there's always two sides that oppose each other. There's her side, and then there's the wrong side. Uh, and so uh, I'm typically uh, on the wrong sides in those battles, but uh, in seriousness or in jest, with any battle, uh, there are always two sides to choose from, and these sides are always in opposition to one another. And so the question this morning, what about with us? What about with us, those of us who claim to be Christians today? Uh, are there battles that go on with us? Uh, well, I would say to that, uh, amen and oh me. Uh, are there sides that oppose each other? Uh, are there times that you and I have to choose? And the answer to those questions are all yes. 
Uh, there are battles that go on in us. There are battles that go on around us. And there are always two sides uh, that oppose each other. And whether or not, uh, whether we want to or not, we make a choice which side we're on. Even if we don't choose a side, that too is making a choice. And so this morning we're going to talk about uh, choosing a side. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 12. Uh, Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to be looking at, we're going to be talking about several verses, but uh, one verse in particular, verse 30. Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to be reading just verse 30. <coughs> Matthew chapter 12. And reading verse 30. And this is what Jesus has to say. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time. Uh, God, again, I see and I read your words. And God, I ask your Holy Spirit to speak those to us again. Give us understanding. Uh, God, for those of us who are Christians, we know this is one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to do that. Uh, God, for those that are under the sound of my voice or maybe who are uh, on Facebook, God, we pray if they have not given their hearts and lives over to you, that they will also do that before it's everlasting too late. God, help us to realize that battles go on around us all the time. And that, God, we choose sides uh, by what we do and by what we say. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And amen. amen. And so I'm reading just one verse today. And I never want to read just one verse and pick it out for, uh, our, uh, for a subject uh, type sermon. And so I want to give you the context of how this verse um, is written and how it's spoken by Jesus. If, if you want to go back and read uh, the verses prior and the verses uh, after, feel free to do that, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, but what's happening is that Jesus uh, is, has just healed, uh, excuse me, or uh, cast out a demon, if you will, and healed. Uh, a man who was possessed. Uh, he was a man that uh, could not speak, uh, nor could he see, and Jesus cast the demon out of him. Jesus healed the man also where he could see and where he could speak. And so the people were amazed. And anytime Jesus performed a miracle, people uh, were amazed. And so uh, there was one group of people uh, that were not amazed, and that was the Pharisees. They actually uh, mocked Jesus, uh, and uh, they uh, were wanting to everyone to think that they were the only ones that could do this. And the Bible speaks of uh, that some of the Jewish leaders actually performed exorcisms, and uh, they, they had this type of power uh, for those people. Um, that, that God blessed to do that. And so um, they said, they actually had mocked Jesus and said that um, Jesus cast out demons uh, by the name of Beelzebub or by the name of Satan. Um, and so Jesus talks to them and says, how can this be um, that uh, the devil cast out his own? And this is where the verses come in and say, a house divided against itself can never stand. Uh, and so uh, Jesus is telling them uh, that he cast out devils uh, by the Spirit of God. And if you go on and read it in the account of Luke, the, the wording is uh, he cast them out by the finger of God. Uh, and I think to myself, well, that, that you do something with your finger, it's pretty light work, is it not? And so casting out a demon uh, is pretty light work for the Spirit of God. Uh, but Jesus uses an example after that of going into a strong man's house and, and plundering the house. In other words, uh, taking what is his. Uh, and he says that, uh, that no one can do that unless they defeat first uh, the strong man of the house. Um, and so um, that is at the beginning of our verse, leading up to our verse. And then the post part of the after of our verse, Jesus is actually talking about uh, about forgiveness for all sin, but one, he talks about the unpardonable sin, about the sin uh, of, of uh, rejecting the Holy Spirit. Uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon a man, woman, boy, or girl uh, and calls you to know that you're a sinner and causes us to know that we need a Savior in Jesus Christ, every time we reject that, uh, that is rejecting the Holy Spirit and that's rejecting the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That is the only sin that cannot be forgiven because if a person rejects Jesus Christ and goes to their burial, goes to their death, draws their last breath, 
That is the last opportunity that they will ever have uh, to see heaven uh, and to be forgiven of their sins. Uh, if you and I uh, do not accept Jesus Christ as our Savior uh, and we die, we must pay for our own sins in a real place called hell. And so, again, we said that uh, God does not intend for that to happen. God did not want that to happen. God does not send anybody to hell. It is man's rejection of the Holy Spirit wooing us to accept Jesus and the free gift of salvation. And so that is the unpardonable sin uh, that is talking about. Uh, all sins spoken against Jesus, he says, can be forgiven. But the sin spoken against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven because that is the rejection of the gospel message when the Holy Spirit draws us. And so uh, this means the only sin that will not be forgiven is when the Holy Spirit draws men to Jesus and he is rejected. And so uh, where does that leave our small verse? Where does that leave our small verse right in the middle? Well, it leaves us with choosing a side, doesn't it? It leaves us with choosing a side. You and I must choose which side uh, we will stand on and which side we will stand for. Uh, the side of Christ and his power to save or the side of the enemy who will, who will be defeated in the end. And you see, the Bible is very clear about end times of what is going to happen. Uh, now, there's a lot of frills of dressing in there that we may not understand, but ultimately, the enemy gets defeated, doesn't it? Ultimately, the enemy is cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. Uh, and so the people that will join him there are the people that reject the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus actually goes on after talking about the unpardonable sin uh, to talking about fruit from a tree. And I know that I've preached this uh, on uh, an occasion uh, in several different times. Uh, and how that a tree is known by its fruit um, and how a good tree will produce good fruit and how a bad tree will produce uh, bad fruit. And so uh, no matter whether we can recognize the tree or not, uh, we can know it by the fruit that it produces. And so he talks about uh, our, uh, us being able to tell without judgment if somebody represents him or represents the enemy. That we can tell by the fruit of a person's life which side a person has chosen. Whether they've chosen to follow Christ uh, and accept the free gift of salvation and live the best way they can in learning to be like Jesus. Or they've chosen the other side where they reject Jesus Christ and they reject his teachings and his ways. And those things that God in his book tells us uh, are making us more like Jesus. Uh, and so our small verse splits these happenings with the thought of us choosing a side to serve. Let's read it again. Jesus says, He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Now, what does Jesus mean by this verse? Well, Jesus says, in very plain terms here, if we are not with him, then we are against him. Now, that may seem like a very simple statement, but I'm going to tell you, folks, it has eternal consequences with it. If you and I are not with him, we are against him. Well, what does it mean to be with him? Well, we're going to talk about that here in just a second. Jesus goes on to say, if we're not gathering with him, we are doing harm against him. That's what the last part of that verse means, for it says, he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Okay, that's what that scattereth abroad means, that if we are not gathering with him, then we're doing harm against him or, or we're scattering uh, abroad or, or hurting. And so you and I must make a choice on which side we choose and to whom we are going to serve. Do you know the verse in Joshua where Joshua is talking to the people? Joshua 24, 15 says this. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. There was no question about Joshua's choice and the choice for his family. Home leaders here, husbands, fathers, let me tell you that Joshua made a choice and it is an example to us you and I represent our families 
in the choice that is made whether we are going to follow the Lord or whether we're not going to follow the Lord. We're going to make a choice to be with Jesus or against Jesus. Whether we're going to gather and help him gather or we're going to scatter. And you and I, as leaders of the home, God ordained leaders of the home have to make that choice for our families. Now, can we save them? Absolutely not. That's an individual choice between a person and God. But we certainly have the obligation as leaders of our home to, to take our family to church, to show them a godly leadership in reading the Bible, to show them uh, in prayer, to show them how we treat their mother, to show them how we are fair and how we talk to them about problems in their lives and things maybe that they may not like and we have to tell them no. And so we have that uh, obligation and we know Joshua says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And Joshua, the fruit that, that bared out from the life of Joshua shows uh, that he did that. And so you and I, we must choose. And the battle wages, the battle wages between what Jesus would have us do and what the world would have us do. Now, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that there's a battle that rages uh, in our lives against uh, against good and evil? Do you believe that? Oh, yes. You know, this it's been so obvious to me over the last few weeks because it just seems like it's... It, 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 and even the last year, because it's something I've had to deal with in my family, um, and families are dealing with it. We've had to deal with it with uh, the girls and sports and the girls uh, doing band and all kinds of different things. Um, and so this is just a little proof that there is a battle going on. How many of you adults remember as a kid anything going on on Sundays from the school system? How many of you remember anything going on on Wednesday nights with the school system? With sports. Folks, I'm going to tell you, the times that we have set aside to gather as a church are under attack. That's right. They are under attack. And I was, the, the past few weeks and even the past year, I know that the enemy has attacked my family and he's attacking the family unit. He's attacking from lots of different fronts uh, with the definition of what a marriage is and from what kids are allowed to see and what they're allowed to do and what's acceptable in the world. And, and, and even in the past few weeks, I've been so aware of how the enemy is attacking families in and through things like sports. Amen. You know, as a father, I have to decide what my family is going to do on Saturday nights. Because if we stay out too late, you know how easy it's going to be to get up on Sunday mornings and how much trouble it's going to be? It's going to be terrible. So as the leader of my family, I have to think about what I do on Saturday night that's going to either help or hinder what my family does on Sunday morning. When we decide to go to ball games on Sunday instead of coming to church, folks, I'm going to tell you something. It's an attack on the family. Yep. It is an attack that these, and, and, and I know I love ball games. I love going to, maybe I didn't love going to band competitions, but I love that my daughters love going to band competitions. And sometimes those band competitions, uh, we wouldn't get into late on Saturday nights, and I had to make a choice. Are we going to get up and go to church, or are we not? I know with, with Hannah, and we, we had this because it was a tournament, possibly could have been her last ball game ever that happened on a Wednesday night. And folks, I had to make a choice with my family. And I'm going to tell you, even good families struggle with these choices. Yep. It's an attack. And it's a choice that you and I have to make. Whether we're going to follow God or whether we're not. And you might say, well, Brother Andy, that's, that's just, you know, that's something simple. Just missing church. Well, I'm going to tell you something, folks. It's a slippery slope. And I can tell you that I have been there. Lori and I have been there. And I would venture a guess that you have been there too. When you miss one service, it's easier to miss the next one, isn't it? When you're not a part of one or two, it's easy to get in a pattern. And all of a sudden, you find yourself out of going to church. And, and, and you just, you're doing other things. It's easy to go fishing on Sunday morning. It's easy to go golfing. It's easy to go to the lake 
And it certainly becomes an excuse when we say, well, we've got this soccer tournament or we've got this softball tournament or we've got this whatever it is that we choose. For me, uh, it would be duck hunting or dog training. Uh, it would be a trial or something where my dog uh, starts on Saturday and has to finish on Sunday. Those are choices that we make and we have to realize that even if it's just something what we call simple, like attendance for church, that it's a choice that we're making. And Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. Not coming to church is a choice showing whom it is that we serve. Oh, Brother Andy, that's just, it's just a Sunday morning. Do you know what the Bible says about the importance of church? The Bible says that Jesus loved the church. Amen. The Bible says that Jesus died for the church. The Bible says that Jesus gave the church instructions to continue his earthly ministry when he left the earth. The importance of church to God is, is beyond what we can think of. And I'm telling you, the enemy is fighting against the church. And he's using families to destroy it. Because if he can destroy the family, then the family thinks the church is not important. And we go and all of a sudden we're in with, the, with what the world does. We're never to take for granted being able to assemble together. The Bible teaches us that. Uh, the Bible teaches us that we're to love and to hold each other up in the church. The Bible teaches that we are to serve one another, guess where? In the church. It, it, this is not a gray area in the Bible. Amen. Anybody that reads and knows the New Testament knows that most of it is, uh, most of it is written to the church right. and about church life. And about how we are not to take that for granted because I'm going to tell you when the enemy can, uh, when he can start getting chinking little holes in the armor of the family, it, it pours down and that starts to destroy not only the family but the church as well. And by this action or inaction, we choose which side we're on. You know, the Bible says we'll be known by our fruits. You can go down and read that down around verse 33, um, how we live. Uh, and by what we do, uh, people will know if we identify with Christ or not. You know, someone once said, I don't have to come to church to be a Christian. Well, that may be true. But I'm going to tell you, what does it say about us calling ourselves Christians if church is not important? If church was so important to God, that Christ died for the church, then how much of an importance should that be for us as Christians? You know, it may be true that you don't have to be a, a church, a Christian to attend church, but what type of Christian says that church is not important? That certainly doesn't come from God. You know, I believe the Bible to be true. In there, the word of God, from cover to cover. I may not understand it all. I may not know it all. Uh, certainly, those that is the case. Uh, but I, by faith, I believe it to be true. And I believe it to be the actual word of God. Amen. And when it speaks of in the last days, there's going to be a great falling away from the church. I think the word for that is apostasy. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to look that up. I believe that that is the time that we're living in. That's right. If you don't believe it, look around at how many empty pews are here on Sunday morning. Today, you and I have to choose which side we're on. For us as leaders of the home, no matter what your age are, if you're a man in this room, you are a leader in your home. Um, if you are a, a mother uh, who's raising a child alone, if you are like my mother who had to do that uh, then it, the, the, the responsibility falls to you. It wasn't ever meant to be that way, but it falls to you as well. Grandparents who have put, put in charge of kids, uh, it's your responsibility, even though it is the father and then the mother's responsibility, and it has now fallen to you by whatever circumstance. Uh, older people in the church, uh, it is still your responsibility to teach the younger that this is what God's word says. 
And when we do these things, we're making a choice. And we must choose which side we're on. And the actions we take will show everyone that choice. And so this morning, we can get mad and say, well, Brother Andy, you should never go there. That's not your responsibility. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you, it's the word of God and it is my responsibility. And I will have to stand before God and give an account for what I have taught and what I have not taught my church family that God has entrusted me uh, to be the leader of. And so I'm telling you, the enemy's out to get you, fathers. The enemy's out to get you, mothers. The enemy's out to get you, sons and daughters and grandparents. The enemy is out to do these things that are so seemingly innocent. To destroy the family and ultimately destroy the church. Because you know what the number one responsibility of the church is? Sharing the gospel message of Jesus yes, Christ. Right. Would you pray with me? Father, again, forgive me for not being the leader that you've called me to be in my home and in my church. And God, I pray that you'll help us, even those who have messed it up, to make a choice to follow you. God, I don't want to scatter abroad. I don't want to uh, hurt your church. God, I want to help it. I want to be a part of it. And God, I want to thank you for the opportunity. And God, help us uh, to band together under the name of Jesus uh, to do that which you've called us to do. God, I pray for those leaders of the family that are out there. God, the fathers. And God, even those mothers who've had to take uh, the leadership role. And God, those grandparents who've had to take the leadership role. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll give us all strength to be able to lead and to be able to teach our families. And God, that we would have strong families that would be a part of the church. And God, to realize that it's a choice when we choose not to be a part of it. And God, again, I pray that it's only you and your Holy Spirit that do the convicting. And God, that your word falls upon all of us the same. Lord, help us to make decisions that honor you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray.